coming up, if you're a child of the 80s, uh, this song is like a rite of passage, a quintessential 80s classic if there ever was one. Now, it went to number one the day that MTV launched, had a music video that was perfect for the channel. The singer-songwriter who brought it to life tells us the inspiration behind the song and how he had to shatter like 24 mirrors to get it just right. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever put uh, tape on those little slots that were on the cassette tape so that you could record on it over and over again, you're gonna enjoy this channel. Nostalgia all the time. Make sure to subscribe to this channel below so that you never miss an episode. Do that right now. If you would, click the bell also so that you're notified of our upcoming interviews. We've got a lot coming. And don't forget to check out our exclusive new series coming up on Patreon, only on Patreon. It'll have behind the scenes footage of our upcoming Professor of Rock Live with Legends, and that's gonna be a lot of fun. You can catch that on Patreon. That's in the description. Also, our new merch is there as well. So I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. Uh, this is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs, uh, along with fascinating insight about their careers. And uh, this one's going to be a good one. On this installment of Revelation, we have rocker Rick Springfield, one of the funniest guys in the industry. He's going to tell us the real story of his 1981 number one smash, Jesse's Girl. Hard to define. Jesse's got himself a girl and I want to make a mind. Now, the song took 19 weeks to hit the top spot, one of the slowest to number one in that time. It ended up being the fifth biggest song in a year where you know, the musical landscape was changing by the second, really. The week that Jesse's Girl hit the top spot, uh, MTV launched, and all of a sudden, radio was just overshadowed by the music video. Just to get us in the time frame and the nostalgia of 81, let's go ahead and paint the picture. So MTV launched, uh, on the other side of the pond in the UK, the specials had just spent three weeks at number one with Ghost Town. This place is called me like a ghost town. It was a great song that resonated with the British people, perfectly capturing the, the sparse existence of many who were inundated with unemployment, uh, urban decay, and violence across the cities. Anti-apartheid demonstrations were taking place uh, also around the world, one at the end of July in Hamilton, New Zealand, that forced the cancellation of a rugby test between New Zealand's all Blacks and South Africa's Springboks uh, by invading the pitch during the game. And half of the 1981 baseball season was lost due to a strike after players and owners couldn't agree. Millionaires and billionaires having problems. <laughs> Both the United States and Russia were performing nuclear tests at, you know, as the Cold War was heating up. And in early July, Sandra Day O'Connor was nominated as the first female judge on the Supreme Court. So many parallels between 1981 and what's been happening lately in 2022. It's just crazy. Well, except for the music. The top 40 from this same time in 81 was so much better than the top 40 of today, but we're going to save that for a Redux episode. Rick Springfield, who is uh, Dr. Noah Drake on General Hospital from 81 to 83, he blew up after Jesse's Girl. I mean, he became the early 80s heartthrob and, and an icon. And he rocked television and the music charts. As the album that Jesse's Girl came from, Working Class Dog, went to the top 10 on the album charts, it had three top 20 hits on it. The aforementioned Jesse's Girl, that hit number one, as I said. And then there was the Sammy Hagar penned rocker, I've Done Everything For You. That went to number eight. Nothing for me, I've done everything for you. And then there was Love Is All Right Tonight, that hit uh, number 20, so three top 20 hits. It's also the soundtrack to one of the funniest scenes from one of my, my favorite comedies ever, Wet Hot American Summer. You gotta check it out. My parents had the Working Class Dog album. They bought it right when it came out or when Jesse's Girl hit number one. I know every single song from it by heart. Uh, they played it nonstop. I know the album cover just as well had a picture of a bull terrier dog dressed in a white shirt and a black tie. The dog was Rick's pet named Ronnie, passed away in 1994. 
Uh, the album was nominated for a Grammy for Best Album Package. Great cover. Uh, Rick actually used the dog again for the cover art uh, for his next album, I believe, which was Success Hasn't Spoiled Me Yet. Jesse's Girl is just a great story. I'll set it up before I hand it off to Rick here a little bit. So Rick Springfield was apparently taking a, a stained glass class. Uh, also in this class was a friend of his and that friend's girlfriend. Needless to say, from there, uh, Rick got some inspiration to write a bona fide 80s classic. But stay tuned because there are some cool stories coming up that are behind this hit. For example, the song was almost called something uh, completely different. Rick is going to give us the goods and he'll even tell us about how he came up with it on his acoustic guitar, as well as his battle to make it in the music business. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand of glasses that uh, I wear daily. If you need a pair of glasses or sunglasses, Zenny is the only choice. I'm telling you, you create your look, you put in your prescription, and you, you pay less than a vinyl record. You're going to be amazed. I've got 15 pair. I've never had a problem for over a year. So here is the story of Jesse's girl. Rick Springfield. Let's go back to the very beginning, Rick. What was it for you that kicked open the door to your mind and made you want to pursue music? Do you remember a moment? Yeah, I do, actually. My my dad was in the, a lifer in the Army, and we traveled around all the time, which was a great uh, precursor for me traveling now. But it was, you know, an Army officer was kicked around the world. So, mm -hmm. um, But they, my dad really loved singing, and, and, uh, and we didn't have TV back in Australia <laughs> before TV. <laughs> How old is this guy? And um, so uh, we would play, uh, they play Rodgers and Hammerstein and Lerner and Lowe and all the great musicals, Oklahoma, Carousel, and writers of those Broadway shows were the stars. The writers were the stars. Uh -huh. and, I, and I would see that, that the, the albums really like had the writers as a headline thing, not the stars of the show. And I think that had a real impact on me. And, I, and it certainly did melodically and lyrically because they're really very smart lyrically. And the music is incredible. I still listen to it. You know, Carousel is one of my all-time favorite albums. And you also took solace in, in books and music, moved around a lot, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I read, it was a voracious reader. I actually um, got eventually kicked out of high school for non-attendance, but I'd stay home and play the guitar and read. I mean, I didn't go out rolling old ladies for crack money, you know, I'd stay <laughs> home and, and, and read. I mean, I, I, honestly, the books I read I'd stolen from a bookstore, but <laughs> that was just because I had to do that, you know, so I gave it some credibility in my own mind. But I'd stay home and read all the time and play the guitar. And that's really what I've done with my life is uh, roll old ladies for crack money. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Well, you, uh, you picked up the guitar at 13, right? I did. I was actually, um, I was 13 and I'd fell in love with the guitar. I was living in England at the time and there was a band called The Shadows. They were, Hank Marvin was uh, the first ro English rock and roll guitar hero and Clapton mm -hmm. and Page and Brian May, all those guys, uh, you know, owe, ad admit they owe a debt to him. And he was the first guy with a red Fender Strat. And I fell in love with it and I used to cut out cardboard versions of it, like full-size cardboard versions of it and I, I'd lip sync their songs in the reflection in the living room window. And then I came back to Australia and uh, said I want a guitar for my 13th birthday. And uh, about two weeks before my birthday, I said, no, I don't want a guitar, I want a robot. <laughs> and my mom went, oh. So I realized she'd already bought it. So I said, no, 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 I want the guitar. So it was probably a good choice because a robot wouldn't have got me very far in my life. <laughs> I started writing when I was 15 uh, songs, and uh, I actually, in my solo show, I do one of the songs called Painted Girl, just because it's so horrible. Painted girl, she's just a painted girl. One more time, just a... You were in a band, Zoot. Tell me about those days. The first successful band I was in, I was a guitar player. It was a three-piece. It was like the, we loved the Who, and we like modeled ourselves on the Who. Yeah. And I started writing for real there and actually uh, arranged a version of Eleanor Rigby, like a, a Black Sabbath version of Eleanor Rigby that is still played today and, and is, is always like on the uh, Australian classic albums and all that kind of thing. 
and uh, wrote another song called The Freak that a lot of people, uh, there was another hit and it was, it was, we were kind of going in a certain direction and we split up, which was kind of a drag because I think we would have really done great things over here. An actual living freak of nature. But the bass player went on to form Little River Band and the- Yeah, I was going to say B Beep, Beep, yeah, right? and, the, and the singer became a big star, a solo star in Australia. And I came over here. So it was kind of like a super group in reverse where everyone used to slam us when we were together because they thought we were a junk team. But then we all split up and went our different ways. and and. Did something, you know. There's a, there's a degree of uh, of success is the best revenge and, and that kind of thing. Big hit General Hospital, Noah Drake. The timing was good because basically Working Class Dog came out. People were seeing you on TV and... Yeah, it was really serendipitous. I mean, uh, you know, people thought it was planned, but you don't plan stuff like that. Oh, no. I mean, I'd had the record recorded. It was all done. And RCA, because disco and ballads were still being played on the radio, they were they were didn't know what to do with this, you know, pop rock album. They go, what do we do? Where does this go? No one's playing this kind of music. So they hung on, sat on it, and sat on it, and sat on it for months. And I'm going, this is this is the next my my next you know failed album is right here. Yeah. You know, I hadn't worked as an actor in like a year, and this agent called up and said they want to see you for this for General Hospital, and I'm going, oh god, I I knew you know soaps. As far as I was concerned, were for old ladies ironing, yeah. you know, the watch during the afternoon. That's what they were in Australia. So I said, all right, I'll go up and I'll read for it. So I read for it and I got it. And I, uh, and I was really, and I don't know if I really want to do this. What's the point? It has nothing to do with music. There's no, there's no correlation between a music audience and a soap audience, which I thought at the time. And I finally decided to do it because RCA had continued to sit on the album and I needed money. And it was, regular, more regular money than I ever seen in my life. It was oh, real yeah. small general hospital, like 500 bucks an episode, which wasn't a lot for, for, for what, you know, what actors were being paid. So I took it and then RCA finally released the album, not knowing I was on the soap opera, right? And the soap opera, not knowing I was a singer and, and Gloria Monty, who is the big producer that came up to me like three months into the show and said, I hear you're a singer. I said, <laughs> I'm not singing on the show. So, and then, the kids who were listening to Jesse's Girl on the radio yeah. started to put together that the guy that was the new doctor on the soap opera, because it was all, all the colleges and young kids and everybody started watching the show. Out of nowhere, it became the big summer show and scheduling classes, uh, college classes around General Hospital because they knew the kids wouldn't show up while it was airing. I had no idea. You know, I couldn't have dreamt that my wildest dreams that this soap opera would have some correlation with my music. And when they, the people put the two characters together, the singer mm -hmm. and the actor in the show, it really kind of lit the fuse and, and things really took off. Absolutely. I remember being in General Hospital one morning before MTV really came on, before that became really big and, and there'd been a big boxing match on cable or on some channel that night. And uh, it, had, it had ended early, it had been a knockout, right? And I guess the guy had scrambled for something to play and they f his hand found my video and stuck it in. Everybody said, oh my God, I saw your video last night on the... So it was the first time I suddenly went, hmm, maybe there was a reason we did this video. And she's loving him with that body, I just know it. And he's holding... Do you remember the first time that you heard Jesse's Girl on the radio? I don't really, but I remember um, first time I, uh, you know, the, uh, when I was a kid, I go to, I go to, uh, you know, I go to concerts and you, and, and you hear the kids do that, and 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 the audience would flip out, and I always and I flip out too because you know, and the first time I on on a in a live setting I went, and the and the crowd went nuts and it was incredibly powerful to me that 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 was more powerful than hearing it on the radio for the first time because I'd been in that audience doing that for the same, you know, for... <laughs> Got a good reason. You know, every Beatles song, but I remember specifically, uh, you know, really got me. Because to me, that, that, that record absolutely blew my mind. I went to see, and I, a lot of the English bands were coming out to Australia, they went to see the Kinks and and the Who and uh, Small Faces and all those great English bands. And uh, remember and that that song particularly because I loved that song. I remember hearing that. And 
uh, the audience flipping out. And somewhere in my 14 year old soul, I said, God, I want that. Jesse's girl, that some people don't realize that was number one the day that MTV launched. Was it? Oh. It was number one the day that MTV And we did a video for it before. I remember going, why, why are we doing this? Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. Where, where are they going to play this? Play along with the charade. So, um, I don't know. I think uh, it was just... Serendipitous. Good, yeah, As serendipitous, you good, you know, luck. and. So you, with Jesse's girl, tell me how that came about the inspiration and, and the writing process. I'd sit around uh, um, and just play, you know, you just, just start playing. I, I just start. I remember, and then I wrote the bridge on the, uh, the chorus on the, on the piano, and then we'd go back to the guitar, and there were kind of two separate songs in my head for a while. Until I finally, uh, put them together and they worked. It was Gary's girl, right? The well, I, yeah, the original guy's name was Gary. And I tried that, but it didn't work. And I actually I actually still have the sheet that I wrote the song. I keep all my yeah. songs. And uh, that's cool. I actually had Randy's girl written up there too. When, when really? Yeah. You know. well, Glad I changed that one. <laughs> finally got the name right. That iconic video with the mirrors being destroyed. Mm. I mean, I remember as a kid, I always wanted to know the stories behind the songs and the videos. and. 20, 24 mirrors is what I Yeah, did. I storyboarded that because I didn't know, you know, there was no one else doing, you know, they said, let's make a video. So I said, okay, well, so I drew, I storyboarded the whole video and then, uh, and then we shot it in like, you know, a day and a half. The big budget was the, the 24, the mirrors. But I want this shot where, you know, I'm like smack, <laughs> yeah. looking to myself and then smashing the, the, the mirrors. And we did it 24 times. And that was, <laughs> that was a bit, that blew the budget right there. <laughs> You must not be a superstitious man. I'm just, I'm just no, sorry. no. <laughs> that proof that superstition is bull exactly. right there. You're right there. I'm going to go break some more mirrors next time I have a record out. <laughs> well, for me, uh, as a kid, when the Chipmunks, Alvin and the Chipmunks covered it, that's when I knew that it was something. Because as an 80s kid, you were like, oh, Alvin and the Chipmunks are doing it. But I got to tell you, it must be story. a classic if the Chipmunks are doing it. I gotta tell you a funny story, man. In high school, I, I was covering that song in my band. Uh, some travel far away, they hired us. I was excited, one of our first gigs, played Jesse's girl, and this girl comes up, and a cute girl, you know, and she comes up and she's like, did you write that song? Apparently she didn't, you know, hadn't heard the and song. And you went, yeah. And I said, yeah. I did, as a yeah, matter of fact. I did write that. She's like, that is an amazing song. Wow, you are, man, I had to do it. I had to do Hope it. Hope you got late. I used to be in a band, the band that I actually went to Vietnam with in in 68, and I was just a guitar player, right? And we used to do a song called She Never Smiles Anymore, which is an old Everly Brothers song. And the, the singer of the band used to always introduce it as our guitar player, Ricky, wrote this song, and the same thing would happen. Girls would come up and say, hi, <laughs> you wrote that song? And I'm going, I better start writing songs. This is, this exactly. is a serious in here, baby. So, also, Boogie Nights, I love that moment, man, where they use Jesse's girl. Ricky Springfield. We had a screening of the movie Ricky and the Flash, and, and uh, we went to a restaurant, and Jonathan Demme walked in, who directed it, right? And I yeah. went over and said, we're leaving now, you know. And I didn't know at the time, sitting with him was the director of Boogie Nights. Really? I, I wish I'd known, because I would have said, dude, thank Paul you Thomas. so much for the resurgence of my song. But he actually wrote, he, he wrote a, 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 an op-ed part about a uh, thing about why he chose that song. And he said, because there's darkness in it that people don't, that it don't get, you know? I mean, it's a yeah. very dark song. Very, 13 very going on gifted. 30, man, that, that was cool too. My kids discovered it and like, that's a cool song. Jesse's girl. I was I had Jesse's girl. Yeah, I, uh, it was uh, some DJ I, I talking to, he said, yes, when the movie came out, he said, I was standing in line and there was this like 12 year old girl in front of me singing Jesse's girl. And I said, uh, and he said, wait, wait how, how come you know that song? She said, oh, this is a great new song I just heard in the movie. Oprah's people tried to find the original girl, right? Yeah, they did, they got close. I, I, I met her in a, a stained glass class. And um, 
and they found the stained glass class. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, but the guy, had, he was an older guy, the guy died two years before, and they cleaned all his paperwork out a year, a year after that, so they missed her by that much. And I've never, oh, yeah. I, I'd recognize her, but, but uh, no one's ever come up to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm her, because they, you know, they know I'd know. But yeah, they never knew about the song. By the way, the reason that Rick Springfield chose the name Jesse's Girl instead of Gary's Girl was because uh, he was wearing a t-shirt at the time with uh, the name of one of his favorite football players on it, Ron Jesse. Make sure to leave us a comment on this Rick Springfield, a stone cold 80s classic. We wanna hear from you. What do you remember about the song? I'll bet the song has resonated with you at one point or another in your life. Definitely has with me. We could change the lyric. Remember, I changed the lyric to the to the friend who, you know, it's like my best friend's girl. Anyway, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe below right now so that you're part of uh, this music community. And check out our videos on Patreon, our new series, and our latest merch. And get your tickets to Professor Rock Live. You're going to love it. Help us keep the music alive. That's the only reason I'm here. <laughs> Till next time, three chords and the truth. Talk to you soon.